Christians are not materialists. That is, we do not believe that material things are all that exists. Only physical things uh, exist. We don't believe that. Some people do. In fact, perhaps many people do. But Christians don't. And one reason we don't is because we believe in God, who is spirit. God does not have a physical body like we do. He is not a material substance. He is a spiritual being. In the same way, or similarly, human beings, though we have material bodies, right, we also have an immaterial soul. We have a spirit. There is a part of us that is not physical. You cannot touch it, but it nonetheless exists. And we believe that God created spiritual beings that we call angels that likewise do not have material bodies, but really and truly exist. We believe in angels. We believe in Satan. We believe in demons. We believe those are real creatures created by God, but they are not material. They are not physical. And the Bible gives us glimpses into this spiritual realm, this spiritual world that exists alongside our world, as it were. And when it gives us these glimpses, it tells us things that we can and must affirm as true, but it also raises a lot of questions that it doesn't answer for us. There's a lot about angels and demons and Satan that we just don't know. Sometimes we can make good, biblically informed guesses. Sometimes we can't even really do much guessing. We just don't know. For example, in Hebrews 13.2, we are told, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, in one sense, that is one of the strangest statements in the Bible. Don't, don't quit having people over to your house because one of these days it might be an angel. Now, apparently that's what happened to Abraham back in, in Genesis chapter 18. You can read that story of the three men who came to visit Abraham, and one of them was the Lord, and two of them were angels. But has that ever happened to you that you know of? But it could. Would you know it if it did? Who knows? But apparently it could happen. Earlier in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. What does that mean? I have no idea. A few verses later, he says about angels, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? That's you and me, right? We're going to inherit salvation. And he says, aren't the angels ministering spirits, so they're spiritual beings, right, sent out to serve for our sake? Well, the assumed answer is yes, but our follow-up question would be, how? How do angels minister for our sake? What are they doing? Right? Sometimes we say things like, you know, man, I dodged that wreck, my guardian angel was looking out for me. Is that what they're doing? Maybe. Is it something totally different? Maybe. We just don't have a whole lot of information. But all scattered all through the Bible, there are these little hints and reminders that there is more going on than what we can see. God is up to more than we are aware of, and God is at work through more creatures than we are aware of, than we can see. Paul, we all know, said famously in Ephesians chapter 6 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There really are not only angels, but what we often call fallen angels, right? Dark powers, dark spiritual 
forces. Satan, of course, being the chief of those. And Paul says, we wrestle against those. And so we're supposed to put on the armor of God, and we're supposed to stand firm, and we're supposed to pray and wield the sword of the Spirit. But if somebody asks you to really nail down how that spiritual combat works, what would you say? What could you say? We listen to God's word, we pray, we trust his promises, but most of what's going on, we don't know what's going on. When we get to Daniel chapter 10, we get one of those infrequent but consistent glimpses into this unseen spiritual realm. And like all those other passages we've looked at already, this is one that tells us some things that are true that we should affirm, but also raises some questions that we can't answer, at least not definitively. Daniel receives another vision in in Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. He tells us it was the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, right? When a word was revealed to Daniel, Cyrus is the king of Persia who told the Jews that they could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And this uh, takes place during the third year, right, of his reign. And so Daniel has not gone back to Jerusalem, but many of the Jews have. He's still in Babylon, evidently. And it says uh, that the the word that he received was true, of course, and it was a great conflict, and that he understood it. And he tells us that it took place, in verse 2, when he was mourning for three weeks. Now, why was Daniel mourning for three weeks. What was going on? I mean, that is, you know, it's one thing to, to fast occasionally, to mourn occasionally, but he says in verse 3 that for these three weeks, he says, I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. Now, what was going on at that time? Well, one Bible teacher explains the, the historical background this way. He says the Lord had moved Cyrus in 538 BC to issue a proclamation permitting the return of the Jewish exiles to their land. That's in Ezra chapter 1. Right? So that's in 538. This, he says, is taking place in 536. So two, three years after that, right? Um, and he says, so here's what's happened since then, though. He says, by September or October of 538 BC, the returning Jews had rebuilt the altar in Jerusalem, and that's in Ezra 3, and by the late spring of 537 B.C., they had begun to work on the foundation of the temple. That's also in Ezra 3, he notes. And then he says, the work quickly stopped, however, on account of hostilities from their enemies living in the land. That's in Ezra 4. By the following spring of 536 B.C., which, again, he's saying is the year Daniel received this vision, He says, Daniel would have heard of the difficulties facing his people back in Judah. In the light of the historical context, it is reasonable to assume that Daniel was deeply troubled over the sad turn of events incurred by the Jews who had returned to the land of Judah and that had brought the rebuilding of the temple to a halt. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Daniel had seen from reading Jeremiah that the end of the exile was approaching, And uh, he had prayed and confessed the sins of Israel and his own sins and asked God to have mercy. And by this time, by chapter 10, God has heard that prayer. God has stirred the heart of Cyrus, Ezra 1 tells us. And he has allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the temple. And they have begun. But the work has already stopped because there are people there who are hostile toward the Jews. They don't want them to rebuild the temple, rebuild Jerusalem. And evidently, this scholar's best guess, and that makes a lot of sense, is that word has gotten back to Daniel about the opposition the Jews are facing, and he is concerned about the fact that they're not able to continue the work of rebuilding the temple, and so he is mourning over this conflict. And so it's appropriate that the vision he receives, according to verse 1, was a great 
conflict, right? And as we'll see later, it involves a great conflict as well. What Daniel sees is a, in, in part anyway, is a vision of a man clothed in linen. He says in verse 4 that he was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris River, and he says, verse 5, I lifted up my eyes and, and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. And he goes on to describe his appearance being like barrel, like lightning, eyes like flaming torches, arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Now, who is this man clothed in linen that Daniel sees? There are basically two options. It could be what we call the pre-incarnate Christ. In other words, it's the Son of God before he took on flesh appearing to Daniel in this vision. Or if it's not him, then it must be an angel. Now, some people think it is the pre-incarnate Christ. Jesus, before, he, before his incarnation, before he took on flesh, the eternal Son of God, and they have some good reasons for thinking that. Because if you've read Revelation 1 recently, for example, where John sees a vision when he's on the Isle of Patmos, he sees a vision of the resurrected Jesus. And he describes his appearance and how when he saw him, he fell down like a dead man. Many of the things that Daniel says here about the appearance of this man clothed in linen sound a lot like what John saw when he saw Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. So normally, that would be just about all the information you needed to say, well, this must be Jesus also. This must be the Son of God appearing to Daniel before he took on flesh. But there's one key problem with that identification, which is that later, assuming it's the man clothed in linen who's talking to Daniel in verses 10 to 14, which it seems to be, this figure talks about a conflict he had with the prince of Persia and how it lasted 21 days and Michael came to help him with that conflict. Now, if this is the Son of God, he doesn't need anybody's help. Not even Michael's help. And if he's the Son of God, the Prince of Persia, however powerful he might be, could not withstand him for 21 days. So I don't think that it's Jesus. Some people do, and that's a legitimate possibility. But that one piece there makes me think, I, I don't think so. So if it's not Jesus, how do we explain the fact that he looks so much like Jesus? That's an important question too, right? So here's how one teacher answered that question, and this, this helped me, it makes a lot of sense to me. He says about this instance and others like it, he says, I would explain such similarities as follows. Those who represent Jesus reflect his glory. Aspects of their appearance corresponding to and reflecting aspects of his appearance. I find it more plausible that the man clothed in linen in Daniel 10, 5 through 6 is an angel who reflects the glory of the Lord. That makes a lot of sense, right? That an angel would share some of the appearance of Jesus because the Bible says when we see Jesus face to face, in 1 John 3, 2, it says when we see him, we will be like him. Well, guess what? The angels see him all the time. So wouldn't it make sense for them to be like him? Just like one day we will be like him? So I think this is an angel who looks an awful lot like Jesus, but is not Jesus. So Daniel sees this man, this man clothed in linen, this angel, angelic being, and how does he respond? Verse 7. He says that I, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. It, it, it seems as though the men with Daniel sensed that there was something going on, right? They, they had a physical response to a vision they couldn't see. 
It's like they knew something was there, but they didn't get to witness it like Daniel did. So they, they left, they fled. And so Daniel says in verse 8, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed. Right? I have a, a, a note that gives another possible translation. My splendor was changed to ruin. I, I think we might would just say all the color drained out of my face. Right? Daniel is it, it's affecting him physically when he sees this vision. He's, he's weak. His appearance changes. He says, I retained no strength. And then he says in verse 9, I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. That is not an uncommon response in the Bible when somebody encounters an angelic being, some kind of spiritual being. Not only does the Bible affirm that these creatures, these spiritual beings, are real, but they are overwhelming to human beings. They're creatures, just like we're creatures. They were created by God, just like we were created by God. But when human beings find themselves in the presence of these spiritual beings, they are often overwhelmed and overcome. For example, in Revelation 19, the Apostle John, who knows better, is standing in the presence of an angel, and he says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, the angel said to him, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. In other words, if you saw an angel, there is a good possibility you would be tempted to worship him because he would be so awe-inspiring, so mighty and majestic and glorious that even though you know better than to worship a created being, just like John knew better, you might nonetheless be tempted to worship that angel because of how awesome he would be in appearance. So the way angels are often depicted, right, in, in our culture, are not accurate. They're not cute and cuddly. If it makes you want to snuggle it, it's not an angel, right? It's, that's not how they appear, right? They are creatures that dwell in the presence of God. And you see some of that glory of God reflected in these heavenly beings if you ever see one, if you ever encounter one. Now, this messenger, this heavenly being, this man clothed in linen, has something to say to Daniel that uh, we might find surprising. It is instructive and it answers some questions and raises some questions. Verse 10, Daniel says, Behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. So he's, he's not flat on the ground. He's, he's on his hands and knees, but he's still shaking. And verse 11 says, And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. Now, who sent him? Of course, God sent him. And so he says, I, I, you are loved, you're loved by God, God has sent me to you, and you need to understand what I have been sent here to tell you. So verse 12, he says, then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. So this angelic being says to Daniel, I'm here because your prayer was heard. When you started humbling yourself, when you started mourning and fasting and praying because you wanted to understand something, right? He says, from the first day, it's been three weeks, from the first day 
your words were heard, and I have come. Okay, so the question that we would want to ask is, well, what took so long? Three weeks is a long time. That's a lot of fasting. That's a lot of mourning. That's a lot of praying. If my prayer was heard on day one, how come you're here on day 21? What happened in between? Well, he answers the question, verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. All right, got that? Everybody clear now on what happened? What is going on? We know this is an angelic being, right? And we know that Michael, who he mentions there, is the one who came to help him. We know that Michael is an angelic being. And we know that because he's mentioned in other places in the Bible, not only here in Daniel uh, a couple more times, but also in the book of Jude, Verse 9, where it says, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So Jude 9 says, Michael is an archangel. It also says he was contending with the devil over the body of Moses, and we have no idea why, or what that would be about, or what was going on. Or how that even worked. But we know he's an angel. And Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, says, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. There again, we see Michael in conflict with Satan in a great heavenly battle where Satan is defeated along with the fallen angels who are cast down to heaven. Again, we get some answers and we walk away with more questions. When did that happen? How did that work? But we know that Michael is an angel. We're fairly certain this man clothed in linen is an angel. And so who is this prince of Persia who withstands an angel that Daniel can't even stand in front of? Must also be an angel, in this case, a fallen angel, who is associated with the kingdom of Persia. A powerful fallen angel, one powerful enough that it takes not only the man clothed in linen, but also Michael, one of the chief princes, as he's described, to come and aid in the fight so that this man clothed in linen can come and deliver the message he's been sent to bring to Daniel. Now, there is hint, another hint in Scripture that there might be angelic beings associated with different nations, different peoples. Right? So later in this chapter, he mentions uh, in verse 20 that he's going to return to fight the prince of Persia. And then he says, and when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Every reason to assume that the prince of Greece is also an angelic being, a fallen angel. And in Deuteronomy 32... Verses 8 and 9, we get another one of those glimpses that gives us some good information, also raises some questions, but helps kind of pull back the veil a little bit. In Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, it says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when He divided mankind, He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Now, when it says he divided them and fixed their borders according to the numbers of the sons of God, the sons of God there are probably angelic beings. And the reason why we know that is because in Job chapter 1, 
It says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Sons of God there, angelic beings, Satan, a fallen angel, shows up for that meeting, right? Sons of God in that instance, and probably in Deuteronomy 32 also, refer to heavenly beings, spiritual beings, angelic beings. And so here we have the man clothed in linen, this angelic being, and the archangel Michael fighting, evidently, with the prince of Persia, a fallen angel associated with Persia. We have mention of a fallen angel associated with Greece as well. What do we do with that? Daniel didn't get his answer for his, to his prayer for three weeks because there was a spiritual battle going on. Angels fighting with one another. The prince of Persia withholding the man clothed in linen who's coming to Daniel with an answer to his prayer and the prince of Persia resisting him so that Michael, who was doing we don't know what until he came to help the man clothed in linen, aids him so that he can get loose and come and deliver the message to Daniel. That's why he came, verse 14. I came and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Now, what do we do with information like that? Well, I think there's a couple ways we can go wrong with information like that. On the one hand, we can say, I don't know, that just sounds like fanciful, imaginary, fairy tale stuff. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any... I think that makes for really interesting storytelling, but I don't believe that's really what's going on. But if you believe the Bible, that's not a legitimate option. right? If you believe that God exists, that God created angels and spiritual beings, why is it fanciful? Why would it be fanciful to assume that they are to, to believe and understand that they are involved in the goings-on in the world, even if we can't see it. Remember the story, I think, it's in, I think it's in 2 Kings chapter 6, with Elisha, if I'm not mistaken, where Elisha's servant is distressed by the army that has gathered around the place where Elijah, Elisha has spent the night. And Elijah, uh, I think, prays and says, Lord, open his eyes, and the servant's eyes are opened, and he sees uh, fiery chariots all over the mountainside there. An army of the Lord of hosts there to defend them. He couldn't see it before. That didn't mean it wasn't there. And if we believe other things that the Bible says about God, about angels, there's no reason not to believe that this is true. But on the other hand, we can use these brief comments, these glimpses into the spiritual realm to come to all kinds of conclusions about how these spiritual forces are at work and what they're doing and, and how they're affecting things in the world that we just cannot possibly be certain about. And if we speak of them as though we are certain, if we become dogmatic about things that we not that we've read in the Bible, but that we have sort of extended out conclusions we've come to from what we've read, but aren't the same thing as what we've read, we can venture into dangerous territory where we start assuming that we know way more about what's going on in the spiritual realm than we really do. It's just a whole lot we don't know. And evidently God intends it to be that way, or he would have told us more. He wants us to know that something is going on, but he doesn't tell us how it all works. He doesn't reveal to us everything that is taking place. He, there's a lot he just hasn't told us. So we have to be careful, and we have to both affirm that what the Bible says about these spiritual beings and their involvement in the world is real and true. Someone says, do you think there could be something demonic going on in this situation? Yeah, maybe. I have no reason to say it can't possibly be. If something bad is going on, could there be something 
be something demonic involved in that? Certainly, there could be. Can we say for sure that this bad thing that's happening is a result of this demonic activity or the prince of this? No, I don't know. I can't see that. My eyes have not been opened to that. I don't know. There's no reason for me to rule it out, but I can't be certain what's going on either because I just don't, I don't have eyes to see that. God has not revealed all that. So we have to be careful, right? Affirm what the Bible says is true, but also be willing to say, I don't know when the Bible hasn't clearly spoken. Now, finally, Daniel uh, is strengthened after this, verse 15, it says, When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. I've got nothing to say. I can't even talk. I'm so overwhelmed by all of this. And so he's strengthened. Verse 19, it says, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Now the end of this paragraph in verses 20 and 21 is as difficult and confusing and uncertain as just about anything we've seen in this chapter so far. Again, he talks about the prince of Greece and the prince of Persia, that he's going to return to fight the prince of Persia. And then he says in verse 21, I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. All of this sets up the vision that Daniel will recount, have recounted to him, or will recount for us, in Daniel 11 and the first part of chapter 12, right? So all of that is, in one sense, just set up. But it's also important because, again, it reveals to us that what's going on in Persia, what's going on with Daniel, what's going on in, in, with Greece, that there are spiritual forces involved in all of that. Now, we're not told about all these things, right, in order to make us fearful. We're not told all these things so that we will, you know, sort of sit in the corner at home and, and cower and, and wonder, like, what if there is some demon involved in this situation? Or what if there's some dark power behind this terrible thing going on in the world? We're not told these things so that we would be frightened. The same Paul who warned us that we wrestle against cosmic powers also spoke of the power of God in Ephesians chapter 1 where he says, "Is the power of God that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ not only conquered demonic powers in his ministry when he uh, would cast demons out of people. He not only defeated Satan through his death on the cross, where he said, now is the ruler of this world cast out. Not only did he conquer them right through his death, but he was also seated and raised and exalted above them, above every name, above every power. And not only was he exalted above all those powers, but it says that he was given as head over all to the church. Meaning he reigns over all for us. Precisely so that we don't have to fear. So that we don't have to be distressed about the dark spiritual powers that are real and that are at work in the world. Because they are not allowed to operate or work outside of the permission of the king of the universe who created them, and that is Jesus 
our Messiah and Savior. So we don't have to fear, but God does want us to be aware. And that means we need to pray, that means we need to know God's Word, and that means we need to trust our Savior who died and rose for us and who, thankfully, rules over all. Let's pray.